So over the last week or so, I've had a number of my perimenopause consultations really focus a lot on bloating. And it's probably a lesser talked about symptom, but in my experience, not a lesser suffered symptom of the perimenopause. And I've had even a few contacts recently when I've been at various appointments myself asking me the question, why are we getting more bloated around this time of life? And I think I have to put my hands up, first of all, and say that we don't know all of the answers, but there's definitely some things that we know are definitely contributing. And so, first of all, if we think about what is bloating, whenever we um, think of if we feel bloated, well, what do we feel? Suddenly our clothes feel like they don't fit some of the time, but then a day or two later, they do fit. So it's clearly not a weight issue because you don't tend to go up and down and weight that much. Um, it's more of a distension issue. And there you say are sort of three things at play. One, it's gas, distending our gut. Um, it can also be an increase in fluid and it can also be that we're constipated and that the gut is actually full of stool that needs to be removed as well. So in simple terms, there's those three things going on. And why do they seem to be more of a problem in this time of life? Well, if you think back to um, whenever you're having regular periods, bloating can also be an issue at this time. And I suppose that furthermore cements the fact that we understand that our hormones actually have an impact all over our body and they have an impact in our gut as well. And we know that dropping estrogen levels and hormonal imbalance and rapidly fluctuating hormone levels clearly are impacting the gut, both in terms of the gut microbiome being affected and um, in terms of the amount of fluid that we're holding both in the gut and in the surrounding tissues and, and also in the motility of the gut as well. And this is definitely an area of lots of recent research and you know, even the fact that we are now beginning to understand that our gut bacteria seem to change and alter at this period of time it seems to be one of the reasons why we're seeing people complain of these symptoms. We even know that our gallbladder so people have probably heard of gallbladders because you'll hear of maybe a friend or a family member who's had their gallbladder removed because they have gallstones. But our gallbladder actually is a small organ tucked behind the liver and it produces bile. And bile has a few jobs to do. But one of the jobs it does is that that bile helps you break down some of your food. And it also helps that undigested food slide through the gut more easily. And we also know that hormonal changes um, really impact the amount of bile that we're secreting. So as you can see, there are definitely are a lot of gut changes that are happening around this time being influenced directly and indirectly by those hormonal changes. So it really does stand to reason why lots of people are complaining that they're feeling that, you know, they can wake up in the morning and fit into their trousers and you know, by the end of the day, it feels like that button on your trousers is hanging on by for grim death because of that distension in the belly. And not only can it be something that can make you feel sort of self-conscious, but it can also be extremely uncomfortable. People can complain that they have crampy pain or they just feel nauseated or unable to eat. What I wanted to talk a little bit more about as well is what other things that you could be doing just on a day-to-day -day basis that are also contributing and making the whole thing worse. So we know that there are definitely foods that we eat that can be contributing as well. And some of these foods are things that we potentially have because we think that they're really good and healthy for us. So for example, I have to admit that I've tried to swap my Coke Zero for sparkling water but in fact, anything carbonated or anything with a fizz to it is also going to contribute to gas within your gut. And then we also have to think about our busy lifestyle. So if you tend to be eating on the run or always in a bit of a hurry, then it's very, very likely that you're rushing your food and potentially, potentially um, like a baby, gulping a lot of air and um, that's also building up in your gut. Another thing that can be impacting your gut and how bloated you feel are things like chewing gum. 
particularly um, because actually the act of chewing is also making you gulp air. But also a lot of chewing gum has artificial sweeteners in it. And a lot of drinks that we have have artificial sweeteners in it. So there's a twofold impact. One, you're gulping more air. But secondly, artificial sweeteners, um, although they're sort of sold as being calorie free, they're not free from side effects on our gut microbiome. And our gut microbiome often can't digest them and often doesn't really like them. So again, another contribution to you feeling bloated and distended. One of the other things is that we're obviously, all of us are very aware that we're meant to be eating more fiber. And there's no doubt that fiber is fantastic for your gut microbiome. But what I find is that myself and some of my friends, we seem to swing between having days where we're really not making anywhere near our headway with our fiber intake and then we kind of go crazy the next day and the reality is that what we probably really need to do is very gently increase our fiber intake so that our gut bacteria can get used to it so if you've ever had been at a dinner party and there's been a a platter of cauliflower and raw broccoli and all sorts and you've been dipping in and the next day or even that evening, your tummy has felt really, really bloated. Well, yeah, okay, you were doing a great thing. You were trying to be healthy at that party and you're trying to eat all the raw veggies, but it was probably just a little bit too much. So I think whenever we think about fiber, we have to think about soluble and insoluble. And if you think about the insolubles, it's like that raw vegetables. And although they are amazing and very, very healthy, you probably don't want to go overboard just too soon. A lot of people also struggle with gluten. So they'll know that maybe eating a sourdough sandwich is okay. And that definitely does have some gluten in it. But maybe when they eat a pizza, they feel really bloated and distended. So it may be that it's not just necessarily that they are completely allergic to gluten per se, but that they're just a bit sensitive to gluten in different forms. And then the other thing that people all across the world are often very sensitive to is dairy and particularly um, lactose. So about 68% of the worldwide population, so the majority of people actually probably don't digest a glass of milk terribly well. Now, I'm not going to get into the differences between that and fermented milk in terms of cheese and yogurt, but usually for most people, that's a lot easier to digest because of that fermenting process. But you can see that, you know, going alongside hormonal fluctuations, which are wreaking a bit of havoc on our gut, add in some of the things that you're doing on a day-to-day basis, and the whole thing can just be a recipe for disaster. I also see a lot of women in the perimenopause become incredibly anxious or have a lot of trouble sleeping. And unfortunately, people will often resort to using alcohol, one, to try and relax or get through the day, or also because they dread going to bed at night because they think they're not going to be able to sleep. And again, unfortunately, we know that alcohol is just not great at all for our gut and causes bloating, both from the alcohol itself, but also because of some of the carbonated mixers and things that we have with that alcohol. So if you are going to have alcohol, my recommendation would be that you need to be leaving at least three to four hours before you're planning on going to bed at night to give your body time to adequately digest and work through whatever you have been eating or drinking. I often get asked by patients how they can work out what foods they're sensitive to. And unfortunately, although we can test for true allergy, So for example, if someone has a nut allergy that's going to give them anaphylaxis that requires an EpiPen, etc., we can test for that type of allergy. Unfortunately, there are no validated food allergy tests that really have had that scope of testing to show that they really are robust. And at, at this point, the best way we have of knowing what we're sensitive to is by removing that food item from our diet and then gradually reintroducing it again. The other thing that's probably contributing as well to bloating in the perimenopause, of course, is poor sleep. We know that a very high proportion of women complain of having very disturbed sleep. And we also know that that wreaks havoc with that um, gut-brain axis. 
and um, causes a lot of stress hormones to be released and a lot less growth hormone, which is our repair hormone, to be released. So it is a complicated situation, but again, getting your sleep back on track is definitely a real priority for me because I know that if your sleep is back on track, it actually will indirectly improve the bloating sensation that you're feeling. It is really interesting because whenever people think of treating menopausal symptoms, it, things like hot flushes are one of the first things that comes to mind. But I have to say it is very satisfying as a doctor to see patients coming in. And I do repeatedly get told that really quite quickly, whenever we get women's hormones under balance, again, using some hormone replacement therapy, a number of women will notice a really quite quick benefit to those bloating symptoms. But in conclusion, yes, hormones are definitely contributing directly and indirectly in a number of ways to this bloating symptom. But there is definitely some other things that you can do alongside taking hormones if they're appropriate for you. I would suggest things like avoiding chewing gum, avoiding artificial sweeteners, trying to have an earlier dinner, trying to fast for a 12-hour period. We know that trying to get back into those natural or circadian rhythms with our body and not eating all the time. I read something recently that said that the average Australian is eating for a roughly a 16-hour window per day. And it would be really nice if we could actually reduce that down. So maybe if you finished eating at seven o'clock at night, and you didn't start eating again until seven o'clock in the morning, at least you would be giving your gut and your gut microbiome a bit of a rest. I think if we can move towards less alcohol, that's going to be really important. And obviously, I do want to really encourage everyone to eat more fiber. There are so many benefits of eating fiber. However, don't go overboard. If you're someone who knows that you're reading really small quantities of fiber at the minute, let's go on a gentle journey. Let our gut microbes get used to it because we don't want to overwork them or they're going to get really crazy and cranky and you're going to pay the price. So start off with soluble fiber. And so things like oats in the morning, maybe some banana, some spinach with your omelet, and um, some flaxseed sprinkled on top of your porridge, and maybe even using things like kefir and yogurt, which are fermented foods that we know our gut bacteria really appreciate as well. And um, let's go on a bit of a gentle journey so that we can get some of these bloating symptoms under control. I know it can be something that people find quite embarrassing, but don't feel shy. Chat to your GP or your menopause practitioner because Definitely, it's something that we can help you with. When I started this podcast back in December 23, I knew that I was lucky enough to have amazing conversations with various health professionals across all facets of medicine and allied health. And I knew that you would probably really enjoy being a fly on the wall to hear what we talked about. And that's how the podcast was born. And what you probably don't know is that this is a bit of a passion project. We don't have any sponsors or funding. And without your help, we won't be able to continue bringing you these great guests. So if you can please spread the word about the podcast, share it with someone who you think might benefit from the conversation that you've just listened to. Or if you can leave us a review or a comment, it would mean the absolute world because that actually helps the podcast spread further and get more people to hear our message and hopefully allow us to invite bigger and bigger guests onto the show. And I would so appreciate you helping me back. Thank you. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare, or other professional advice. Information is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. If you have any health concerns, always consult your doctor. Thank you.